Hello, and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broader reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxham, Research Project Coordinator at the Sainsbury Institute and Researcher of Language and Japanese War Heritage. This week we are joined by Adam Hunt, PhD candidate at the University of Sheffield, to compare crime between Japan and the UK, and how factors such as attitudes towards former convicts affect the systems, that is, reducing the rate of reoffending. We hope you enjoy the show. Okay, good morning Adam, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Hello, thank you for having me. So first off, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Can you tell us about your area of expertise and how your interests have brought you there? Right. So my area of expertise is desistance from crime, which is how people transition out of crime. What brought me there is general undergraduate research. I had a teacher at Manchester Metropolitan that did research with a group of his friends, about 20 friends that were like drug offenders. And he researched how they all transitioned out of crime. Sort of my interest started there. And then my own personal research and experience with Japanese media gave me an interest in Japan. So I started learning the language and I sort of just combined the two interests. So from my work in desistance, generally in Western spheres, and then realized that very few people have actually done research on Japanese desistance in English. There is a small piece on the topic, but other than that, I'm not aware of anyone writing in English on desistance, though people are writing on desistance in Japanese. I see. So let's begin by looking at crime and punishment in the UK and Japan in general. In a recent episode with Dr. Viviana Andrescu uh, on capital punishment in Japan, we discussed that while Japan has a relatively low crime rate and a powerful prosecution system, the general public has a high fear of crime. How does this compare with the UK? It's very similar. If you think about Japan and England in terms of how they operate, in terms of information on crime, they both have a media that is using the same systems to gain viewership. And in contemporary society, the talking points tend to be globalized. So the homogenized view of crime across the world So I suppose it's a very very long explanation. And Japan, oddly, has a high fear of crime. I mean, one of the best indicators of just how concerned with crime Japan is, is the number of volunteers that contribute towards crime prevention activities in Japan. They number in about 3 million of a population of 125. The stats might be slightly out of date, but that is a extraordinarily large amount of the public that are actively contributing towards crime prevention measures, even though Japan has a very low level of crime in terms of statistics, recorded crime statistics relative to the wider world. But um, we'll we'll get onto that topic in a second, I believe. So the general media then is uh, the main driver behind public concerns around crime in both Japan and the UK, is that correct? Yeah, so the news, online publications, YouTube, based on my reading, there's a level of political mirroring where politicians will address media concerns and sort of validate the, their existence by addressing them as real concerns. But yeah, my reading on this topic is not extensive. My understanding is that yes, that there is a a high fear of crime, even though Japan is arguably the safest country in the world. Okay. I'm somewhat skeptical of the claims that Japan is a low crime country, particularly around sexual harassment. I remember sitting through an induction before my year abroad where the women in my class were told how to deal with chikan or molesters on public transport as though it were a common nuisance. Uh, I later learned that while 65% of women in Japan reported experiencing groping, over 95% of such incidents weren't reported to the police. 
In your opinion, do you think there is a gap between crimes committed and crimes reported in general? I do. There's significant evidence that there is such a gap, even outside of Japan. I have some statistics that are worth considering um, just to sort of set up the discussion. So in Japan, the number of police recorded crimes, and this is based on a white paper that was published in 2021 on crime in 2020 by the Japanese government translated into English. So the listener can actually go and look at this themselves. The number is 750,000 police recorded incidents. In England, the number of police recorded crime is 6 million. So obviously that's a lot higher. So that's police recorded crime. That's not self-report data. One thing to point out is that Japan's population is 125 million. And the data here is from England and Wales. And the combined population of England and Wales is roughly 60 million. So the relative difference in terms of crimes per population is very close to 15-fold approaching 20-fold in terms of recorded incidents. But if you look at the crime survey for England and Wales, which is self-report data, you will see that in England and Wales, there's an estimated 12 million incidents of a penal code violation, which is a fairly sizable gap between the recorded crime and the actual number. In recent times, because of the crime survey for England and Wales has put in significant effort into attempting to drive up police numbers to represent true levels of crime, because obviously you have that crime survey data that's telling you that there's all these crimes that are happening that aren't being recorded. So initiatives to get people talking to the police, especially with sexual offences, which are significantly underreported because of the possibility that like, re-victimization that occurs whenever someone reports crimes like that, which are troubling. In terms of Japan's underreported crime, there's a few factors to get into. In terms of sexual offending, understanding that requires getting into power dynamics in Japan and its overall structure and how that may contribute towards sort of people not wanting to come forwards. I see. So let's consider criminal demographics. What are the social backgrounds of convicts in the UK and Japan? Are there any striking differences that jump out to you between these two countries? So between these two countries, the demographics of offending, generally speaking, relate to the type of crime you consider. The majority of crime is made up of crime related to ability to survive. So if you look at Japan, of the... 750,000 crimes, roughly 500,000. So well over 50% is theft. And theft is usually driven by socioeconomic deprivation. In England, it's very similar. The majority of crimes come from socioeconomic deprived areas. Something worth noting is the motivations to commit crime are relatively varied based on the actual specific offense that occurs. Something that is worth explaining is the age crime curve. Of the large portion of offenders committed, there's sort of two types of offenders. There's short-term offenders that sort of only commit a small amount of crime. And there are long-term offenders that sort of have life circumstances that make it very difficult for them to effectively engage in normal society. And these people will usually have longer careers of offending. We'll get onto this subject later. So there aren't specific types of offenders if you look at literature on this. So there isn't too much specialization in offending. So you, you don't have like specifically a thief or specifically a violent assault person or specifically even sexual offending in, in some cases. So if you think about why someone will get arrested, if they are in a life circumstances that is conducive to criminal activity and the people they are associating with, they will have various activities within that life. And so they will generally be caught only for a few, maybe even one of those activities, which means that in terms of data, when you see a person that's committed a violent assault and a person that's committed theft, there's an entire possibility that both of these people have very similar 
lives in terms of criminal offending if they are long-term offenders. So that's worth bearing in mind in terms of demographic characteristics. Something in terms of difference between England and Japan, in terms of the demographic characteristics, there's the obvious point, which is England is a lot more ethnically diverse and the there is a significant amount more of socioeconomic deprivation. Something worth pointing out is that Japan has a different age of criminal responsibility. So the actual landscape of its criminal justice system and the people that it's dealing with is slightly different. So Japan's age of criminal responsibility up until about April of this year was 20. So you are considered an adult at the age of 20 in Japan. There has been a slight change where if you are sentenced for something over a year, you will be treated as an adult from the age of 18 now. And that's only just changed. So that was April that that rule change went into play. I'm not entirely sure what the implication of this and how it's going to play out in relative terms. The other point to raise in terms of demographics is that Japan is, again, it's isolated relative to England in terms of demographic factors that would compose a country. So England has got a lot of different nationalities in its DNA, but Japan is very homogenized. Consequently, a lot of Japanese culture is built around the understanding that everyone knows all of these social rules. One big difference that stands out to me is that talking about socioeconomic difference in the uk we have the mentality of a class system of working class middle class upper class and these uh, distinctions of blue collar white collar crime whereas japan has a very large middle class so there isn't so much stereotypical views based on your socioeconomic backgrounds maybe in japan when it comes to crime mm, yeah that's true one of the Difficult things about talking about crime in Japan is that criminals occupy a different space and category relative to the, the wider population. So if you think about theories on Japan and Japanese culture, you have to very carefully consider whether those theories are applicable to the specific group of people that are offending in Japan, which may be composed of the people that aren't necessarily Japanese. So it's it's something that would require like extensive statistical work to just double check all of the stats on like what percentage of people are committing theft and so on and so forth. Uh, something that I didn't note earlier was one statistic that I have in terms of comparing England and Wales that's useful for the discussion going forward. I'm not 100% certain how comparable exactly these two stats are, but I have the stat for charge or summoned in England and Wales, which totaled about 315,000. And then in Japan, they had offences with a finalised judgment, which is 250,000. So the, the relative difference there is about twofold compared to 20-fold in the official statistics. Um, I just thought I'd, I'd mention that now while I remember. Oh, interesting. So your research is centred around desistance, defined by UK Justice Inspectorates as the process of abstaining from crime by those with a previous pattern of offending. Before getting into desistance, what are the most common reasons behind reoffending? So answering this question requires explaining generally desistance. The most common reasons behind offending are a person's life is not conducive to a life without offending. It's a very vague answer, but on an individual level, the motivations will be different. On a general level, the motivations are blurred. There's no real patterns that are easy to identify outside of financial need. Everything's quite personal to them in terms of how they orientate their lives. So to further explain desistance, I believe you've got another question for me that will lead into this. Yeah, so could you unpack the process of desistance for us, placing it in the context of how justice systems have attempted to deal with reoffending in the past? So the first thing to note about desistance, as I noted earlier, is the age crime curve. You've got a large portion of people that will be called adolescent limited offenders. If you look at the graph, there's a big spike 
around the age of 18, where people start being sanctioned for offenses and not being deflected into youth-related rehabilitation. And then over time, this curve sharply and then gently decreases through to about the age of 30. So you have a large cohort of offending that occurs at the age of about 20. And then over time, this will gradually decline in the population. So people are slowly phasing out of committing crimes. The specific age that this spikes up varies between countries based on their practices for the response to youth offending. So that's the main background of the systems research is trying to understand why people transition out of crime. So there's this inherent assumption, which isn't understood widely, that people will actually eventually exit crime and people aren't offenders for life. There are, of course, exceptions to this rule. Japan is one of the notable exceptions. Japan has an offending population that is growing older. There's old offenders in Japan. So there's definitely social conditions that can change this pattern of offending decline. Japan's a unique country in terms of desistance because it's aging and there is a declining birth rate. So there's a lot less young people and a lot more old people which means the actual structure of society is a little different. And a lot of inherent assumptions that exist in the system don't apply specifically to the older population of Japanese uh, offenders that are specifically offending because there's an inability to live there, um, which is surprising that when you start reading about this, because you're sort of, you, they said there's a double take that you'll do. And then you also realize that there's no one writing about this in English papers, at least. I'm aware that there's definitely people doing research in Japanese on this, as you would expect. The explanation of desistance is very multifaceted. There's four different things that are worth noting in terms of why people are transitioning out of crime. Why people transition out of crime is based on their relative agency. So agency as a concept, is a little difficult to summarize, but contemporary thinking places agency as a relative power to the environment a person exists within. So each person on an individual level will have a different level of agency to affect change in their life. And this will be based on a number of factors. There's obviously structural factors. So things like um, if a country has a criminal record, you will want to look at how that is affecting their ability to gain employment and things like that. One of the important factors that's noted in desistance research is the concept of pro-social bonds. So connections and events and people and bonds in life that are positive in terms of influence. So these are things like marriage, things like employment, things like friendship, family support, and any number of small things, and obviously it takes different shapes. So it's understood that as a person goes through life, they will accumulate pro-social connections, and these will motivate and change their life in a way that makes offending seem less needed. In the case that specifically where someone gains employment, there is another side to this, which is the concept of internal change for the offender. The ability to obtain pro-social bonds is based on a person's ability to get those bonds in some way. So to gain employment, you need obviously skills. So for a lot of offenders that have come from socioeconomic deprivation or very poor backgrounds, they may not have in the peak of their offending those skills. So in order to desist, they require some sort of internal change of skill set change. So there's two sides to this. The motivation to change needs to kick in and also the ability to change needs to kick in. So what desistance research sort of does is identify where in society people are gaining these supportive mechanisms and relationships. There's also background to all of this change and desire to change is the concept of a feared self or sort of negative motivation from offending. Say, for example, you look at an offender and they have been to prison and they start talking about some of the people that they met in prison and they'll sort of explain 
that they were looking at this 20 years older person, so in their 50s or 60s, that was still in prison and um, had some sort of realization that that may be them if they continue offending and that they do not want to do that. So you will get increased motivation to change over time as people realize that there's sort of more negative events that can happen because of offending. Overall, desistance is centered on the concept of support and supportive mechanisms in society. And this can be state-run support lines. It can be drug counseling, all sorts of things. Does that answer your question? Yeah, very comprehensively. Thank you. I guess one last thing I would like to ask about that is, do you know how far a public sympathetic to past offenders is an important factor in uh, desistance? This is a very interesting question. It's something that I've been trying to think about. There is historical perception of Japan as being a sympathetic country to offending. Braithwaite wrote a piece that sort of explained Japan was restorative in the way that it approached criminals. That isn't entirely true, and there's been a lot of pushback from Japanese scholars and researchers in general that Japan is actually quite disintegrative. The sympathetic nature is only important in the case where criminals are being identified in society as they are trying to desist. So if you think about it in those terms, in England, because the criminal record is disclosed before employment, the reaction to offenders will heavily inform their ability to make one of the pivotal changes to their life necessary to use end offending, which is ability to obtain money in a legal way. I have spoken with several colleagues in Japan, and I have mixed messaging on whether or not people are required to disclose their criminal record to people. And I've been told that they do, and I've been told that they don't. So I'm not going to comment at the moment. My understanding is Japan does have a criminal record. And I think it's variable whether it's public or not. For young offenders, I know that it isn't. So that would be people currently under the age of 20. But yeah, being sympathetic towards the offender is important, specifically in the structures that can provide support. So a person called Dana Segev did research on desistance in Israel, and she found that family reaction to offending there is very supportive. There's sort of this view that a person offending is the responsibility of that family, and it's the responsibility of that family to correct that behavior across even close family connections. So the response to offenders is very important to consider, but it varies by stakeholders that you think about. So family, the state, the probation service, employers, any of these different aspects of society that are interacting with an individual will have a potentially different reaction to that offender based on the ideology and culture that they exist within. So yes, the answer to your question is, it is important that people are sympathetic towards offenders in facilitating desistance, but how that sympathy manifests in reality is obviously very complicated. Sure. And I guess beyond on a personal basis of how people respond to meeting and interacting with past offenders, there's also the grander political level, right? So when you think about, again, to refer back to right-wing tabloids in the UK and the Conservative Party's stance on law and order about having more police and removing parole rights for people who commit serious crimes, increasing sentences. There doesn't seem to be much empathy for those who have committed crimes. The voters on the right, at least, seem quite keen to lock them up and throw away the key almost. So without empathy towards offenders, there is no capacity to uh, give people legally the opportunity to uh, start again, I suppose. I agree. It's it's very tricky, the political landscape in terms of dealing with offenders. For the offenders, what is best is a society that tries to understand them, tries to understand why they're offending. I feel like we are slowly, at certain levels, starting to understand that offending isn't necessarily entirely the offender's fault. 
but there still needs to be that understanding that crime will be punished, that people can't abuse the system and you've got to have all these systems in place. And the right wing ideology has always been to be very punitive and to really embrace that righteous condemnation that we have historically in us um, based in like religious ideology of placing someone as an other and us as superior and creating a very black and white world. But in terms of offending, the drivers of crime are usually quite nuanced and the real solutions to crime are structural solutions. But yeah, I agree that there's a lot of political ideologies that aren't productive. One of the issues you have is that the crime problem is so nuanced that the real answers don't appropriately fit into sort of short sound bites that sure. you can build a campaign around. I don't know, it's, it's an interesting point. And I got, sorry, I got one last question. Um, I mentioned earlier about the very strong prosecution system in Japan, which has abnormally high prosecution rates of over 90%, and how they have the rights to technically hold someone who's been arrested for two, three weeks if they so choose. And this can lead to false confessions. And so people can very rapidly find themselves in a position where they're being cast as an offender when they haven't actually offended with little recourse to defend themselves. So surely these people, if they are convicted, they can't really be called re-offenders if they haven't offended in the first place, they've been falsely imprisoned. But what can be done to address this? Well, I, I don't believe anyone in England really has the knowledge or capacity to change that. Something worth considering is that in Japanese society, the entire structure is very different and the level of trust people are given on an individual level is a lot higher. There is sort of this inherent belief in people that there won't be abuse of power. England and English people are very skeptical of giving the state specifically overt power because this history, this identification of corruption and things like that. So the statistics there are pretty scary. If you were to consider those statistics to exist in a place like England, but something worth remembering is that the Japanese criminal justice system does have some level of deflection before sending people to courts. And if you look at the actual numbers in the white paper, a higher percentage of people are turned away from prosecution. So the burden of proof doesn't happen in the courtrooms. It happens elsewhere. And the police are given a significant amount of responsibility in that regard. And the standards of policing expected in Japan are a lot higher, just in terms of qualifications and practice and probation, for example, requires like undergraduate degrees. There's just extremely high levels of education in Japan. And so it's very important to consider the contextual factors around Japan when you view a specific cultural practice and, and not to sort of draw comparisons one-to-one -one and situate all of the various components to that discussion. So I think the best thing to do is to wait for someone specifically to engage in research on those topics and look at those rather than sort of make guesses at the time when we don't really have full information about how these systems are being used. My assumption is there's significant abuse of power that's occurring in Japan, but I don't know the scope or scale. And Japan is a very utilitarian country, as most are. So collectivist countries tend to be very uh, group orientated. So the individual and the individual's right aren't seen as pivotal. They aren't the central point of the cultural dialogue, as you would find in a place like America, which is extremely individualized. So concessions are made for the individual to improve the wider functioning of society. I hope that sort of answers. Yeah, that does. Thank you. And uh, for any Japanese study students out there looking for a PhD topic, there you have it. Thank you for answering my questions today, Adam. Before we finish the episode, could you share with us what other projects you're currently working on? Other than the PhD, my other projects are learning Japanese, which is very difficult and all-consuming, and <laughs> I'm still very bad at it, to be honest. I'm looking forward to trying learning in Japan, see if that makes a difference. I'm hoping 
once the PhD is finished, to complete a more robust dissistent study with my colleagues, where I will have a Japanese native and researcher help me interview uh, probationers there, rather than me do it, which is what I'm planning to do with the PhD. Um, in terms of research quality, it would be extraordinarily helpful. Just in terms of understanding the data itself, facilitating better quality interviews, and the, the scope of the project would be better. So I'm, I'm basically planning to do the PhD again, but with someone, which would be really nice if I can actually manage it. Excellent. Thanks again, Adam. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. You can find the link to Adam's research profile in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe on JapanInNorwich.org or on your preferred podcast provider for updates on new episodes. You can also get in touch to recommend topics for the podcast at cgs at uea.ac.uk. Join us for our next episode with Sophie Richard, art specialist and acclaimed writer on Japanese museums, as we explore art museums in Japan of every variety. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening. <laughs>